Good afternoon. I'm Ryan Homan, Vice President at Friends of Cancer Research. On behalf of the Lung Map Accrual Enhancement Committee, thank you for joining us this afternoon for a virtual meeting on Lung Map, advocating, accelerating, and amplifying lung cancer discovery. Lung Map, established in 2014, has thrived because of our incredible partners that make this trial so unique the National Cancer Institute and its National Clinical Trials Network, SWAG Cancer Research Network the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health and Friends of Cancer Research. On behalf of all of us here today, I wanna to thank the incredible 4,990 patients that have participated in Lung Map to date. Today, we'll hear from experts in the field of oncology who have helped lead this trial. They will discuss recent trial updates, challenges to the traditional trial landscape that Lung Map is working to overcome, and opportunities for patient engagement in the process. This meeting is being recorded and will be available on the Lung Map, SWOG, and Friends of Cancer Research websites and YouTube pages. Our presenters will do their best to answer your questions today, so please type them in the Q&A box and identify yourself and your affiliation when doing so. I will be back later on in this program to moderate a panel with three incredible advocates. But now I have the pleasure of, to turn things over to my colleague, Jennifer Newsom who is Project Manager for Translational Science at the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. Jennifer. Thank you so much, uh, Ryan, for that introduction. I am really excited to be here. On behalf of the LungMap team, we thank you and appreciate you for taking the time this afternoon to be a part of the webinar. So to give you just some background about the purpose of today's webinar, we wanted to do a few things. One, we wanted to provide updates about the trial. We have some really great studies that we have open and want to share that with you today. We also wanted to give you a glimpse of what it's like to enroll patients into the trial. So we're going to be hearing from a clinician as well. Most importantly, we wanted to highlight the voices of advocates. And so we have an amazing panel that's going to give you their perspective about different trial related topics and their opinions on, on their experiences with clinical trials. So you're definitely in for a treat. With that being said, we're going to start things off with Dr. Karen Redcamp. Dr. Redcamp is the vice chair of the Lung Map trial, and um, under her leadership, we have uh, continued to do a really amazing job with the research and the studies that we've been able to do, and she is also really great to work with. With that being said, I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Redcamp. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer and Ryan. And um... I'd like to just provide a little bit of uh, introduction to Lung Map. Ryan started off with uh, some of the accomplishments of Lung Map, and I think we have a slide. Thank you. So this um, shows, um, first you see the map on the left-hand side, and one of the, the, the biggest um, advances with uh, Lung Map is that this is open at more than 900 sites of which more than 50% are at our community sites. And some of the research that um, has been done, much of the research is um, reaching patients in our rural sites. And that uh, there's some uh, data that will be coming out from Lung Map and the outreach to the rural sites um, probably shortly. Um, so we are, we have been uh, proud of the work that we've done and to increase um, access for patients with Lung Map. And in this process, we have had um, more than 13 partnering uh, industry uh, partners for precision medicine and more than 15 investigational drugs that have, um, have uh, gone into combinations for testing and um, 16 sub-studies sub initiated, 14 of which have been completed. Um, and generally, these, this process has allowed us to open studies more quickly and really, again, trying to get access to patients, um, having a 12 month average for startup, which is uh, pretty rare from idea um, approvals to, uh, to startup. Um, the average month to uh, getting to target accrual is 22 months, again, a very quick time frame. And we've served large numbers of patients, over 4,000 screened, um, more than 650 per year, and um, more than uh, 2,500 eligible for trials. And we have um, treated patient more than a thousand patients um, with uh, therapies on lung map, and this has led to uh, publications, more than thirty-five publications, and um, these the uh, the partnership that um, the uh, Friends of Cancer Research, FNIH, and industry bring together with our NCTN group really has made 
um, progress for many drugs and many patients. And one of the things you're going to hear about um, upcoming with uh, Dr. Redman is our Pragmatica trial, which started with a concept in lung map that showed a positive outcome for ramsirumab and pembrolizumab. And then we were able to partner again with the NIH and CTEP and the NCI to uh, come up with a pragmatic design to, again, better serve patients and, and serve our community and increase access um, to trials. So you'll hear a little bit more about that. We're excited um, that all of these processes have involved our patient advocates trying to make sure that the processes are reasonable for patients. We're trying to expand the way that we, we allow for testing for patients and um, looking toward the future as new agents come through as uh, LungMap has been a very viable and productive platform for um, understanding the, the use of new drugs in lung cancer. Thank you, Dr. Redkamp, for the presentation and your commitment to participating in this, even while traveling. We really very much appreciate it. Uh, I'll now turn the program over to my AEC colleague and SWAG uh, Lung Committee patient advocate, Judy Johnson. Judy? Thank you, Ryan. And, and thank you, Dr. Redkamp. Welcome to everyone. It's so good to see you. We're excited to have all of you here with us today. And I'm happy to facilitate this session to share updates on current studies. Following our three speakers, we'll have some time for questions and answers. So please put them into the chat as they occur to you. First, let me introduce Dr. Suki Pada, who will provide an update on lung map S1900E. Dr. Pada is professor of the Department of Hematology and Oncology at Fox Chase Cancer Center and the Vice Chair of Medical Oncology at Fox Chase Cancer Center at Temple University Hospital in Philadelphia. She specializes in interventional clinical trials and translational research in thoracic oncology, including genomic subsets of non-small cell lung cancer, lung neuroendocrine tumors, and thymic malignancies. She is the principal investigator for lung map S1900E, which is for patients whose cancer has a KRAS G12C mutation. Dr. Pada? Hi, Judy. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for that uh, lovely introduction. I think, uh, as Dr. Reitkamp mentioned, LungMap is a wonderful platform to ask very important questions that we wouldn't otherwise be able to. So I want to show you on the next slide our schema for LungMap S1900E. Um, so uh, we are getting very precise in lung cancer. Um, there are many molecular drivers of lung cancer. Uh, one of them being KRAS mutations, uh, which are probably the most common mutations we find in non-small cell lung cancer. But we need to be even more specific. So now we have uh, drugs available for the subset of KRAS G12C lung cancer, and one of those drugs uh, being sotoracid. And so what we're asking in this trial with my co-chair, Dr. David Gerber at UT Southwestern, is whether other mutations or other abnormalities in genes impact the activity of this new drug, sotoracid, for KRAS G12C lung cancer. And so patients who have a recurrent or metastatic disease with this specific biomarker of KRAS G12C, um, as long as they've received one therapy, are potentially eligible for this clinical trial. And so we are trying to ask even more precise questions. Um, do additional mutations to KRAS G12C, such as in P53 or SDK11 or KEEP1, impact how well this drug works? So based on those additional biomarker definitions, uh, patients are assigned to these different cohorts across S1900E, and all patients are given the same treatment. And our primary endpoint and objective is to look at what are the response rates and how do these additional mutations in the tumor impact the efficacy of this drug. Next slide, please. And so this is a status update, and I think this is actually quite uh, remarkable. So this a study activated in April of 2021. And literally the next month, 
there was accelerated approval for Sotoracid uh, for this patient population, which was wonderful news. Um, and we were thinking, oh my gosh, it's always difficult to um, enroll to a trial and make sure we're answering our study question when the drug is so widely available. Uh, but we have at this point uh, accrued to the study 82% of participants who have volunteered to join the study. So I just want to say a huge uh, thank you uh, for the participants and patients who have participated in S1900E, uh, because this is the only study that's really asking this question in a prospective manner. So thank you for that. And um, of the different cohorts that I mentioned, uh, all of them are still open. Um, one of the biomarker cohorts with the P53 mutation in the tumor, that one is almost fully accrued, uh, but we still have two slots. And the other two cohorts, we have multiple slots uh, available. Um, so we are hoping uh, to uh, be able to continue to offer this to patients, at least uh, for the short-term future. The other thing important about LungMap, just to reiterate what Dr. Reckham said about all of the academic sites and community sites uh, that are participating uh, throughout the U.S., is the potential to offer clinical trials to more diverse patient populations. So when we looked at uh, last when 70 participants uh, were accrued, looking at the race, ethnicity, background, uh, we can see that 80% um, of participants were white. And also we had 10% of participants who are black. So we are hoping by the time that we enroll this entire study that we'll also have been able to offer uh, this tr trial to a diverse uh, patient population. Uh, we were able to uh, present uh, some of this interim uh, updates at ASCO this year, our big annual meeting. Uh, so that was exciting. Uh, got a lot of activity and talked to some good colleagues and friends at the poster session this year. And one of the important parts of LungMap as well is to be able to do additional translational studies. So patients on the study have also volunteered for additional blood collections for us to examine any tumor DNA in circulation. So we can ask further questions of what resistance mechanisms develop. Are there any other biomarkers that we could find that would be useful in how we make treatment decisions in KRAS G12C lung cancer? So thank you so much for your time, and I, I really appreciate you listening today. Thank you, Dr. Pata, for the update. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Mary Redman. Dr. Redman is a professor in clinical biostatistics in the Clinical Research Division at Fred Hutchison Cancer Center. She has extensive experience in clinical trials, in particular in phase two and three trials incorporating biomarkers, particularly in lung cancer. She is the statistical chair for the Lung Cancer Committee in the SWAG Cancer Research Network and head of the Biostatistics Corps for the Fred Hutch Lung Score and the statistical chair for the Lung Map Master Protocol. She will share information about a couple of trials uh, that will be important for you to know more about. So thank you so much, Dr. Redman. Thank you, Judy. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm very happy to share with you about the Pragmatica Lung Study and the S1900G study. So if we could see the next slide. Thank you. Um, so this, uh, as, as Dr. Renkamp mentioned um, at the beginning of this webinar, um, S2302 or the Pragmatica Lung Study is our first graduate from the Lung Map Master Protocol, which um, is very exciting. The predecessor study for this trial was S1800A, which um, was a randomized phase two comparing pembrolizumab and remisiramab to standard of care for patients who have previously retreated Treat, uh, treated with immunotherapy and platinum-based chemotherapy. The Pragmatica Lung Study differs slightly from this trial, and, and you can tell by the name, the focus, that this is a pragmatic study, and I'll tell you what that means, at least for our trial. Um, the study uh, uh, schema is presented here, and you can see that our investigational treatment is exactly as the predecessor study, remisiramab and pembrolizumab, and then the standard of care arm is actually a little bit more flexible than we had previously. And, and essentially, if, um, if a treatment is in the NCCN guidelines, um, you can treat your patient with that standard of care regimen on this trial. Um, the primary endpoint for the study is overall survival, and our accrual goal is 700 patients. 
And this slide, um, I didn't have a chance to update it. So you can see the accrual to the study, which opened, I think, back in March. Um, by June, middle of June, we'd accrued 39 patients. But actually, as of this morning, we've enrolled 80 patients. So this study is accruing very well at over 20 patients a month. And I mean, it's very exciting. Um, listed below of the slide, you can see this whole group of wonderful leadership on the study. Dr. Redkamp is the study chair. Dr. Konstantin Dragnev is the co-chair. I'm the statistical chair. We have other statisticians and other wonderful people that work on this trial. Um, but the major um, import of this study and why this is pragmatic, as you can see on the slide, there are two objectives for the study. The objectives are to compare overall survival between the arms and to summarize reports of serious and unexpected grade three or four adver adverse events and all grade five adverse events that have to be determined to be um, treatment related by the treating physician. And the reason why we wanted to do that was that in the predecessor study, there was no evidence that, that the um, imaging-based endpoints um, had activity with the combination and that we really just needed to focus on overall survival. Additionally, both ramiserum and pemeluzumab have lots of, of safety data from previous studies. The combination on our predecessor study actually was less toxic than the standard of care arm. And so therefore, we really didn't need to collect all the information that we do on our standard studies. So I'll go into some more detail as you showed me the next slide. So what a pragmatic design is and, the, and our goals for S2302 are the pragmatic lung study are, are listed here and we want to be able to empower investigators to treat their patients as they would do in the real world. So it's not as controlled as the standard clinical trial. We want to decrease barriers to enrollment so that you don't, you, it's not just a specific select subset of patients, the best performing patients can go on to this randomized study. We also wanted to minimize the burden of data collection, and I'll go to, into that in more detail. And if you think about those three key criteria, um, those features define what a pragmatic design is. And so a pragmatic design um, is really used to inform decision makers on effectiveness versus efficacy, which you do in a controlled setting. And the comparative balance of benefits, burdens, and risks of a health intervention in clinical practice. And this is in contrast to exploratory trials, uh, explanatory trials, excuse me, that test efficacy under these ideal situations in these specific settings. And so we really want to know, does this intervention work under usual conditions, patients that are out there in the real world? And, but in contrast to some more real world designs, our pragmatic design actually does have registrational intent. Our goal is to get this, this our, our investigational treatment approved for, for treatment for patients in this disease setting. So it's very exciting. Next slide, please. So to contrast a little bit more the difference between pragmatic and standard randomized clinical trials, pragmatic designs have limited eligibility criteria and as I said before, we want to enroll and treat patients as they would be done in the real world. And then we want to have minimal data collection elements. And you'll see that on the study calendar and other things, whereas standard studies have more extensive or more complex eligibility criteria, which is important when you have an investigational treatment that you don't know the safety of and you need to evaluate these things more carefully. They specify treatments a lot more um, per um, more strictly. And so they may vary from institutional standards. And then because it's more investigational, you oftentimes have these uh, more complex um, study calendars with collections of labs, imaging, and other biomarker results. Next slide. So, so the value of this slide, you don't need to read all of these eligibility on this slide, but this slide encapsulates all of the eligibility criteria for the study. And, 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 and if, you, if you hit next, you can see, um, Thank you. That in essence, we define the eligible patient population as being patients with stage four recurrent non-small cell lung cancer who've received prior treatment with immunotherapy and chemotherapy, have performance status zero or two, and then satisfy um, the criteria that they can safely receive the treatments that we have on the study. But all the other, other criteria that you standardly see on a clinical trial are left up to the treating investigation or investigation well, treatment, excuse me, left up to the treating physician to determine if the patient can safely receive the investigational treatment or the standard of care treatment. Next slide. 
And then I wanted to show to the calendar and, and because this is the calendar, as you can see, it is a very simplified calendar. All we're doing are collecting vital status, serious adverse events, and then you can see when the patients are to receive treatment. So again, it's a very simplified um, calendar, um, which is, should also make it a lot more easy to, to um, conduct the study at different sites. Next slide. Thank you. And as you can see outlined here, we have no protocol specific um, disease assessment schedules. So treating physicians can do that per institutional standards and not need to report those data to us. There's no protocol required labs to be included. Again, physicians will treat their patients and determine what they need to do. There's no specimen collection. We're not doing it, um, extra biomarker analyses. We're not doing these um, these studies that we we basically want to just know does this treatment work on average in all these patients and and that's the question and then you're only required to re report on all grade five and then unexpected and treatment related serious adverse grade three or four events so it's a very simplified data collection next slide So again, to, to talk, dive deeper into the pragmatic design and data capture, as I mentioned before, we want to minimize the data collection. So there's reduced time points and there's no disease assessments, labs, specimen collection, the reduced um, adverse event reporting. We're estimating that um, we're going to be collecting about 90% less. So only about 10% of the adverse events that one would standardly collect on a randomized study. And um, there's also a reduction in the data to monitor and audit at a different site. And then in contrast, as I think people who are well experienced know that standard clinical trials have extensive and complex data collection, collection of labs, um, resist measurements, um, concomitant medications, and other monitoring that's, that's much more extensive. So next slide. And so here's the data um, submission schedule and requirements. And you can just see here that we're collecting some on-study study information, our vital status at the beginning, on-study forms, eligibility criteria. We are collecting pd one status, but that's just from previously collected or done labs. And then when the patient's on treatment, sites only need to submit vital status and adverse events. And then there's a, just a couple forms to submit off study and then um, notice of death if, if that happens for this patient. So um, again, very, very simplified. So next slide. Could I have the next slide? So um, I hope that that uh, those of you on this call have, if you haven't opened the study, Pragmatic Lung Study at your site, that that by seeing this information here, that you understand how um, exciting this study is. It's accruing well. It's groundbreaking. We need to make it a success, and we think that we have a high chance that this is going to be a very positive study. And it's a it's a no matter what, it's a positive study for patients because it's it's really about access and treating patients out there in in the real world. So thank you for your attention about that study. I would next like to share with you about um, a sub-study that's been um, open not, for not very long, um, the S1900G study. And this we're also very excited about. And this is a departure from previous studies in lung map. So this is a study um, randomized phase two of capmatinib plus osimertinib with or without remiseramab for patients with EGFR mutant met amplified stage four recurrent non-small cell lung cancer. Let me break that down a little bit in more detail because that was a lot of words that I just said in that title. So these are for patients, the study is for patients who have the EGFR mutation in their lung cancer. They previously re received osimertinib. And then when they unfortunately progressed on osimertinib, they were found to have the met amplification in their tumor as a resistance mechanism. And what we're trying to do with this study is overcome resistance to that met amplification. And by giving them capmatinib with osimertinib and the VEGF inhibitor of remisermab. The study chair for the study is Sarah Goldberg, and her co-chair is Dr. Ross Kamich. Dr. Kate Goldberg is at Yale. Dr. Ross Kamich is at um, uh, Colorado. The um, lung map champion for the study is Dr. Jyothi Patel. I'm the statistical chair. And then, of course, these are all overseen by the lung map um, ch uh, chairs, uh, Dr. Hosberg Guy and Dr. Karen Redkamp. On the next slide, um, you can see the background for this, and I think I kind of overcovered this, that um, patients with advanced EGFR mutated lung cancer oftentimes respond well to EGFR inhibitors, but that unfortunately um, resistance develops. 
and EGFR um, inhibitors um, have a common resistance uh, mechanism, which is MET amplification. And so we, um, and data suggests that the addition of VEGF or VEGF um, inhibitors, uh, VEGF2 inhibitors have, the, have a, a good likelihood or a good science behind it to increase the, um, uh, prolong uh, the ability to re remain on this treatment and therefore prolong time to progression-free survival. And preclinical data also supports this. So next slide. Um, so the schema of this study, um, I think we've gone through the eligibility criteria. You can look into it um, in more detail, but in essence, randomized phase two, where the standard of care in the setting um, is or could be considered capmanib plus osimertinib, so continued osimertinib, and then the investigational treatment is adding ramucirumab. The primary endpoint for this study is progression-free survival, and we do have other secondary um, objectives to look at toxicity, response, duration of response, and overall survival. Survival. The accrual goal to the study is 60 eligible patients. We usually estimate about 10% of patients to fail to meet eligibility. Um, and so we are going to accrue a total of, of 66 patients. And there are some stratification factors. Um, I will share that um, the study's been open for, for a few months now, and we've um, accrued two patients, which we're, we're quite pleased with. So next slide. So the key eligibility are presented here, and, and not surprisingly, you want to have documentation that the patient has a sensitizing EGFR mutation, and they've had radiographically or clinically progressed um, in the opinion of the treating investigator. It doesn't need to be, um, it doesn't need to be a virus cyst on osimertinib. That amplification needs to be post um, progression on osimertinib, and so um, they can either have that done by the clinic that they're seeing or on, um, or on study, and then they need to have measurable disease. Next slide. And then additional eligibility criteria, um, good performance status zero one, and other just key safety criteria to be able to receive an investigational treatment. But this is all detailed in the protocol. Next slide. And then in terms of um, identification of med amplification, um, there are sometimes um, met amplifications that are, are variants of unknown significance. We do need these to be of known significance. So on study testing, it'll be very clear through foundation medicine, but otherwise we will have our study chairs evaluate these. So um, the details are probably best reviewed in detail with people who understand met amplifications or within the study chairs. Next slide. Well, thank you for your attention, and I hope if you have a patient who's received osimertinib with an EGFR mutation and is found to have mid-amplification on progression that you consider as the S1900G study. Thanks so much, Dr. Redmond. Now I'd like to move on to hearing from our clinician speaker, Dr. Jay Nyack, who will talk about lung map at his institution and some of its opportunities and challenges. So briefly, he's board certified in international, excuse me, internal medicine, medical oncology, and malignant and benign hematology. He's been practicing for 12 years in the community setting. He has extensive research experience that he gained during his residency and fellowship in clinical basic science and academic research, and has served as a PI for NCI sponsored clinical trials. He re relocated his family from New York to Anderson, South Carolina in 2016 and is currently practicing at AnMed Health Cancer Center. He's a registered physician investigator with Upstate Carolina NCORP and leads the site for lung map trial accrual. And he is one of the top 10 accruers for lung map. So thank you so much for all you do, Dr. Nyack, and we look forward to hearing your comments now. Uh, well, thank you, Judy, for the wonderful introduction. Um, uh, I guess, uh, we were surprised as much as a lot of other people were that we were in the top 10 sites of accrual. We are a very small location in upstate uh, South Carolina. It's a small town called Anderson, uh, more rural than suburban. And so I think the opportunities here are very limited in terms of uh, clinical trials and things like that. So we were pleasantly surprised when uh, we saw our name there in top 10 and uh, we are happy for that. Uh, I think the credit goes mostly to our research team here, uh, because if you are a community physician like me, I think the time you can allocate to clinical research 
screening and uh, enrolling patients into trial is very limited because we are doing both him and onc and community medicine so it kind of gets difficult um i'll go to the benefits of lung map uh, you know the most important thing for us we were actually for a time being of me here affiliated with another institution from charlotte north carolina and uh, uh, for a time being, a lot of my patients who would need clinical trials, especially uh, molecular testing based clinical trials, they'll have to travel about an hour and a half, two hours to go to Charlotte and be enrolled there. Um, so having that access locally made a big difference uh, for a lot of our patients who would travel if they have to, I think anybody, anyone would. Uh, but if things were available in their locality, in their community, then they do not have to do all that traveling uh, to go to another institution, see different doctors than what they are used to to be in a clinical trial. So I think that made a big difference for a lot of our patients, and we were very excited when it opened up here. And that probably was one reason why we probably screened and enrolled as many patients as we could, um, because we are in um, Carolinas. I think uh, tobacco use is quite common here. So we are sometimes, uh, you know, we are faced with a lot of lung cancer patients. So we probably have maybe a little more than a lot of other localities would have. Uh, but having this trial made a big difference because now patients will feel like that they are kind of uh, going hand in hand with the world and they are getting the trials and the medications that would be available in let's say Atlanta or Charlotte or Duke, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, which are about two, three, five hours uh, travel from here. So I think the initiative from LungMap to open it into multiple community uh, hospitals and centers was really good because we are, we are the sole uh, care provider within uh, surrounding counties, but we are not big enough that uh, you know, uh, many trials will come to a community hospital you know, uh, to seek uh, enrollment in clinical trials. So, uh, we are very thankful for that. Um, and as I said, the credit goes mostly to our research team. Uh, being a community hospital, we do not have a big research team, uh, but even with limited resources, they were screening patients from the lung nodule clinic to uh, the pathology being available and then to the oncologist office and letting physicians know that this patient is eligible or this patient can go on a certain trial. And, and that definitely helped uh, tremendously in enrolling uh, patients in lung map trial and help us as well as our patients. Um, one of the thing with lung map was that I think Foundation Medicine was the only uh, uh, NGS uh, that was uh, accepted and is accepted. And many a times in in the past, I think three four years ago, there were only a couple that were more commonly used, including Foundation One. But now I think there are many other uh, like uh, tests are available, and a lot of a uh, lot of the time patients will get it sometimes through the pulmonologist office or certain tests are more uh, easily available uh, in certain geographic area. Uh, the good part is if they needed foundation one, I think it was covered without any cost to the patient. Uh, the bad part is that you need an extra test. So I think. Uh, no, that was definitely something that we ran into a little bit of trouble here and there. Uh, but if uh, you know, lung map would allow some other uh, NGS to be included, I think that would definitely expand the number of patients that can be enrolled as well. Um, I guess um, that's that's all I have to say. Any questions I can ask? Thank you so very much, Dr. Nayak. That was so great to hear your perspective. And we really want to spend a lot of time with the advocate panel, and we did not get any questions. So I want to thank you, Dr. Nayak, Dr. Redman, Dr. Pada, for your comments. And I would like to now turn this over to Ryan Homan to run the advocate panel discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Judy. Uh, thanks also to Jennifer and Drs. Redcamp, Redmond, Nayak, and Pada for your wonderful remarks and presentations and perspectives. Uh, now I want to dive in and introduce our wonderful panel today of patient advocates who are on screen with me. Uh, we have 
Terry Conoran uh, from KRES Kickers, Ivy Elkins from EGFR Resistors, and Upal Roy from Longevity. So let's get right into the conversation. And for those at home, feel free to uh, drop any questions in the Q&A at any time during this panel, and we'll try to work them in. Uh, so we'll start with the topic that uh, Dr. Pada, Dr. Nayak uh, all alluded to, as well as Dr. Redcamp in the beginning. Um, one of the advantages of lung map is molecular screening and the large number and wide geographic distribution of enrolling sites that have been touted as advantages of a lung map. Patients who enroll in lung map get state-of-the-art genomic profiling to determine genomic alterations or mutations, which may drive the growth of their cancer. To date, Foundation Medicine's tissue-based NGS has been the test required either during pre-screening, screening, or prior results. Um, as, as we just alluded to, though, there's possible new initiatives to reuse the results from other NGS tissue testing platforms and maybe from liquid biopsies to qualify patients for lung map. So, Upal, I'll, I'll start with you. How would this expansion affect patients' um, perception of lung map to start with? I'm going to go back to what Dr. Nayak said that, you know, the state of precision medicine today is that there are multiple NGS platforms available. And I think from a patient perspective, the ability to use other testing platforms to be enrolled in the trial will be a huge game changer for a couple of different reasons. First of all, it will not cause any delays because the patient will have a test report in hand that can be used for enrollment. So that's a great thing. And the second thing is, if for some reason there is not enough tissue remaining to do that second test because the patient's already had a, an NGS test before, then there is the possibility or the need to do another biopsy and the patient can be spared of doing that second biopsy. So I think the ability to use your own NGS test to be considered for lung map would definitely go a long way to help with both recruitment and of course, making the trial more patient centric. I, I completely agree. It's, it's huge for for a patient, I mean, the last thing you want to do if you find out you have progression and you've already had a biopsy is find out mm -hmm. that, you know, you're trying to go for a trial that won't take information from a biopsy you already had. Mm -hmm. So it'll make it a lot more flexible for patients. I mean, these lung biopsies are invasive. I mean, yes. you know, people end up with collapsed lungs, pneumothoraxes at the end, hospital time, time away from their families and their, you know, their jobs. So this is going to make it a lot more accessible to a lot of people. Harry, do you want to jump in and expand on that a little bit, what this mean, would mean to patients? It's, it's everything. You can't get at it if you don't know what you are. So mm -hmm. like anything that's going to speed up treatment, knowledge, information, it's just going to make people live longer and better. Great. So how important, and moving on to, and we talked a little bit about the Pragmatica lung trial, which is a spinoff of uh, S1800A, which is great progress um, shown from lung map. How important is that? I'll, and I'll keep with you, Terry. Uh, how important is having a non-match arm, or in this case, a referral to a other trial? Uh, how important is that? On the Pragmatica trial? I'm sorry, I didn't catch you. Just generally part. having a non-match option for these patients. You, you know, you, how else are you going to actually get a real sense of what's going on in the world unless you um, have something that's a little bit less matched, right? It, the more controlled it is, it's fantastic from a scientific perspective. However, the more you kind of drill down into what we're really going through is people, not just patients. That's really where the where the line is. Yeah. Rupal or Ivy, do you want to jump in on that at all about the importance of maintaining? Because that within the evolution of lung map, we've run into circumstances where the, the non-match has gone off. Um, and we've been very cognizant of, of making sure that we have this option and very creative with the uh, spinoff of Pragmatic at Lung now. I think, you, I mean, if you're going through all the testing and time to apply for a trial, I mean, as a patient, you want to feel like at least there is something there for you. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to get to like this process and hear, okay, well, you don't match with any of these trials. So 
okay, go back to the starting point, you know, go back to, you know, your hospital and start looking again. So I think it's very important to have an option available for patients. I mean, I think it's also important to let patients know that that might not necessarily be the best option or the only option for them. But I think from a psychological point of view, just knowing that there is an option is incredibly important. It becomes really deflating and defeating both when you when you hit that wall of now what? And so that, that, that's it. And you feel like literally you've hit the end of the earth and now what? I'm just going to fall off the side of it. Yeah. And Upa, maybe build on that. How are these options then best explained to patients? I think, again, uh, Ryan, going back to sort of the original intent of lung pap, it's a precision medicine trial. And I think really articulating that, that there is something for everyone. And even when we think of non-match, right? You know, that is also precision medicine driven because of the fact that you don't have biomarkers that have a match therapy, but that does not mean that there's that there isn't something for you. So I think articulating that, that this is a precision medicine trial and there is something for everyone based on the molecular profile of your tumor, I think is, is that value proposition. Well, and the four of us had a pre-conversation and we talked a little bit about um, the complicated eligibility criteria that exists within lung map uh, for, stu for study entry and for entry into specific sub-studies. Um, how are the criteria, rationale, and options best described to patients? Ivy, maybe I'll start with you. You know, um, when patients are considering joining a trial, there's so much going on. You know, they've just found out that they their cancer is growing again and they're stressed and they're upset and they're trying to figure out how that's going to fit in their lives. So in addition to dealing with that, then, you know, complex information about the criteria for joining a trial makes everything just really overwhelming. So really the simplest terminology things can be put into to understand and, you know, having things repeated again and again and letting patients have the opportunity to ask questions, even if they've asked it before. All of those things are really important because it truly is a very stressful, overwhelming time and a time where you have to make an important decision but, you know, frequently a lot of the terminology and language is over your head and seems extremely complicated. Yeah, and Terry, do you want to build on that? I know in our discussion, the idea came up a little bit of even an executive summary or a brief summary uh, that could maybe be employed in lung map. Absolutely. You know, the, the thing is that it's like, okay, when you're going through something like this, it's like your house is on fire and somebody wants to hand you like a huge dictionary to read. Mm -hmm. You need to have a picture of the highlights, okay? Even when it comes to something really complicated, like say stocks or something, or just even, you know, um, financial plans, you have an executive summary that kind of hits the guidelines, it hits the points of what it is I really need to know right now, you know, kind of the quick start guide. OK, of whatever it is I need to do um, to make this happen and make it work for me, because seriously, your body is literally like on fire with cancer and you need to not even just make decisions. You're not you need to qualify for something. You don't understand what you need to qualify for. And suddenly your brain goes to mush and you're trying to figure out what it is that you need to know and where you need to go to do it. And building on this a little bit, then, um, you know, a patient who's entering lung map may not have full awareness of the time required, the expenses, what the treatment plan is. You know, is this something else that lung map can maybe be a leader in? And what what kind of information, how, how simple are patients looking for when they're giving um, the expectations of what their future might look like on this trial? Well, Google. it's not just money, Go it's here. location. It's, it's kind of like, and I don't mean to jump in. But no, it's please, yeah. real estate, right? It's location, location, location. And it's not just the location it is in my body. It's a location of what is going on as far as the treatment opportunities. And the more you can branch out, I mean, it was, it was amazing to hear from a doctor who's in Anderson, South Carolina. I'm in Charlotte. 
I know what it is he's talking about. Mm -hmm. And to hear that people are getting connected for that information, right? And being able to participate in lung, lung map. It's really powerful to have that as an option, but we can't do it unless we know about it, okay? And if it's not local, what can we do about it to bring it to the patient? Sometimes it's collecting blood. How hard is that anywhere? Yeah. I, just, I was just going to add on to what Terry said, and it's really about transparency, right? Ryan, being very upfront with the patient about what is required for them to participate. What's going to be that overall burden? It's not just the financial burden. It's time away from family. It's It's travel time, everything. And also being transparent about the fact that this is this is an option and you'd still have the ability to have other options right and dr nayak's point just goes to show that it is just really possible to enroll patients in trials in community centers if there are trials i think that that's the biggest thing that i took away from his point that if trials are there patients will want to participate offer them to patients being transparent about what the expectations are what the burden of participation is and just reminding them that this is the best option or if not there are other options for you it's just really that transparency piece that's important so let's dive into some specific here that maybe we can build on um, and lung map can actually potentially implement so what do patients what do patients need to know um, how is this information best conveyed is this written materials working groups, patient navigators, our, our incredible nurses. Um, let, let's talk through some best practices or examples that you all have seen that, that have been well received by the advocacy and patient communities. Well, all, yes to all what you said, because, <laughs> it, you know, it, it, it's not just one place and one thing that you're done and you understand, okay? You're being handed all sorts of different opportunities, but you don't know what it is you're, you're looking at. And so I need to hear it and I need to hear it from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. The nurse navigator is going to give me a different perspective than my oncologist is going to give me. An oncologist is going to give me a, a different perspective than my, my PCP or a radiation oncologist or something. And so I need to understand the different parts of it. And again, you have a sense of urgency because this is my life that I'm playing with. But at the same time, I need to know who it is I can go to to ask those questions. And from a practical standpoint, what are the other types of support mechanisms that I can get, whether mm -hmm. I need help with transportation or child care, or is it I need to understand the trial or I don't care, just get me into whatever it is that's going to work for me. So when it comes to precision medicine or it comes to personalized medicine, it goes back to what we just said. It depends on the person in the medicine. Yeah, there can't be too many lines of communication or or modes of communication. I mean, also, um, patients are all different, you know, just how, you know, we're all different kinds of people and different people learn different ways and absorb materials different ways. I mean, some people are more visual, some people are more auditory, some people prefer to read about something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having the, the information available in different, you know, modes, you know, videos, written materials, conversations with nurse navigators, you know, workshops. I mean, all of that improves the ability to access a more diverse group of people, which is, you know, the goal of Lung Map after all. So, uh -huh. I don't have much to add to what Terry and Ivy said, I think they articulated everything. One example that I'd like to share that I've seen work really well and going actually to examples, Terry's point about sort of an executive summary, I think having that as an information card or, or something that just distills out core information that pa patients are interested in knowing, what, how will I qualify for the study? If I do not qualify, what else is there for me? What are the risks of being involved in the study? What are the costs and other burden? I think those are the things because in the informed consent, it's just so complex and there's so much of legalese for a patient to sort of sift through all of that and kind of make an informed decision. I think it's just crazy going back to IV's point that these decisions are being made at a time of high distress. So we have to make it as easy as possible for patients. Another example that I've seen work really well is giving the patient at least five to seven days of time 
we've heard from patients that sometimes the turnaround to decide that you're going to participate in a trial two days. This is a life and death situation that a patient is making and 48 hours to make that decision in my mind is very unreasonable. And I've seen that those trials that give up to five to seven days and also providing the patient and the caregiver, if there's a caregiver, a number to call if they have questions so that there's that continuous dialogue going back to what both Terry and Ivy were saying that that one and done thing I think doesn't work. So having multiple touch points before the patient makes a decision to participate in a trial works beautifully. I know going back to Dr. Nike's point that that definitely depends on logistics as well. Sometimes you might not have the resources to be able to do this, but having at least an executive summary to make it super easy for a patient to come to that decision, I think goes a long way. I think we've we've heard that throughout lung map a lot. And from the launch in 2014, we made sure that lung lung-map.org was up and running and trying to answer as many questions as possible. So when the the individual caregiver goes home and hopefully has more than 48 hours to make a decision that that information is digestible outside of you know simply the entry on clinicaltrials.gov uh the the breadth of lung map allows us to do that obviously not every single clinical trial can have its own page like that but we would encourage uh, any pharmaceutical company that's running a clinical trial that has the resources to to do that um, and I think to your to all of your point, it sounds like the the ability not just have question and answers being in that moment where you're frozen in time, but when you actually have the ability to think about it and come back. Um, what to we've spent a lot of time over the years with lung map um, figuring out what the physicians need to know because oftentimes it's very difficult for them. Um, for them to understand this clinical trial and all of the different uh, functions that are going on. So how can how do you think we can better equip uh, the physicians themselves and the nurses with information so that they are able to anticipate and answer the questions from patients? Can so you open I, their minds better? <laughs> <laughs> well, because it, it really is a matter, it doesn't matter what it is you're looking at. The more open the mind, the more receptive the heart to what it is that you're looking for. And when a, a doctor, a patient, nurse, when they really are trying to, a care partner is trying to really cure the person or get the best treatment, you need to be able to give them enough space and enough grace for that decision tree to go through, do a calculation of what it is and what's gonna work for them. And so you need to have all the viable parts of the input in a very transparent manner as everyone's already very well articulated here, but it still boils down to you're gonna have questions. And whoever picks up that phone, okay, how many times do you dread calling a helpline? Okay, and would you hesitate to call your own helpline to ask questions about that particular trial? Because what is the answer you're going to get is going to depend on the person on that other end of that phone. And so it kind of you need to really put it down and, you know, drill down to what is your customer service look like? because it's not just customer service, I can return this computer. I've got the body that I've got and I've got to make a decision and I need to understand this better. Otherwise, we're not getting enough information to make valid decisions. Have you ever do you wanna? Yeah, um, I'd just like to add that, you know, as much as we say that, you know, patients, things have to be streamlined and, you know, have an executive summary, I think doctors need that too. I mean, they have so much going on and there's so many trials out there and many of them are not only thoracic oncologists, they're covering all different types of cancer. So, you know, there needs to be an easy, quick way. Things need to be bolded. Things need to be easy to find um, to make sure that, you know, this is top of mind. If, you know, someone comes in and is potentially a good fit, you know, they have to be able to make that connection clearly and quickly. So in the theme of not every patient is the same, and Dr. Uh, Redmond talked a little bit about um, some of the focuses of lung map in, in recruiting uh, minority and underserved populations into these trials. Um, we had a question from the audience. 
wondering how how the trial can and how you all have seen um, encouragement of enrollment in uh, populations that are traditionally not uh, very involved or participatory in clinical trials. Uh, any thoughts on how lung map can can help to overcome that? The closer you get to a patient's community, mm -hmm. the better opportunity you have to be all inclusive of that community. And it, the diverse patient population is, is just the same as everybody else. We're not getting enough biomarker testing. We're not getting enough clinical trial information out there. And so it's going to be disproportionately not included. So get closer to our homes and closer to our hearts and we'll make big differences. And, you know, think about, you know, when talking about the trial and publicizing the trial to use, you know, role models that show mm -hmm. the diversity that, you know, you're looking for. That's, it's really important when people are considering participating in something to feel like it's inclusive of people like themselves. So I think that that could, you know, help go a long way as well. And I would, I think, push us a little bit further and say, I think the diversity of the research team also goes a long way, especially if they're members of the research team who come from the community. I think that is a huge, huge way in establishing trust with the community. And again, I'm just going to go back to Dr. Nayak's point that so amazing that you have trials in the community, patients will participate in the trial. And I think that's that fundamental piece, right? If you're there where the patients are, if you build trust, you're a part of the community, they will participate in the trial. Maybe I'll, I'll use this last couple of minutes here to let each of you have uh, kind of a closing remark or any advice uh, to the lung map team and how we can improve the trial beyond what you just said or take home point for uh, the hundreds of patients that are joining us from home. Uh, we'll start with uh, Upal, where we started off, then Ivy, and then Terry, we'll let you close it out. I don't have any advice for the team, but I just say continue to do your good work. One of the things that I love about the lung map study is it's really evolved with the science of lung cancer and evolved with the needs of the patient. The discussion that we had about having different NGS tests, that's sort of the change in the diagnostic landscape. So I think being flexible and nimble continue to do that. I think that would be my advice. Ivy? And I totally agree with Upal, and I'd like to add to that. Also, continue to keep patients and patient advocates involved and get, you know, our thoughts, find out what we feel are the unmet needs, what we're looking for, and get us involved, you know, if you're starting, if you're thinking about opening a new, you know, sub-trial, sub-study, get us involved from the beginning and let us be true partners on, on the team. And I think you'll end up with a process that really does meet what patients need. Very good point. Terry? You know, it's hard to expand on all that they said, but I think to wrap it all up with everything what we're saying is we're all people, we're all community, and we need to be um, more cognizant of the fact that it should not be copy and paste when it comes to doing clinical trials. If we're talking about the patients, we need to be getting the advocates involved because it's our survivorship that's really what we're fighting for. And keep doing what you're doing, but realize that we want to do it. We're living for your hope. And the research y'all are working on today is going to be saving our lives tomorrow. So just keep on doing what you got to do and let's get it there. Wow. What a closing statement, Terry. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Redmond did let me know that uh, that I can share that a paper will be coming out soon that evaluated representation of, represent, the representation of uh, other populations in the lung map screen population. Um, I do want to extend my thanks and gratitude to all that participated at home today that watched this. Uh, thank you again to the lung map study team for presenting, the Accrual Enhancement Committee for organizing. Uh, the advocacy organization leaders here with me today for sharing their insights. Uh, and most of all, once again, thank you to all of the incredible people that have and are participating in this trial. Um, I do also want to note the recording will be made available to all those that registered. It'll be emailed to you, so feel free to share that link. Uh, you can also watch Twitter uh, or check out lungmap.org or the Friends website for the link coming soon. 
um, and any questions that you may have that weren't answered today, uh, whether live or in the chat, please uh, email us at lungmapaec at swag.org, and that should be put in the chat right now. So thank you all once again, and have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you.